Hello, welcome to Book Nerd TV. At the end of 2019, I read two books that seem to share quite a bit in common. One book was Heavy by Kiese Lehman. The other book was Hunger by Roxane Gay. Both are memoirs by very talented authors that tell of some of the trauma from childhood that they have had to deal with over the course of their lives and how that trauma continues to impact their lives even today. I'm going to provide a warning for anyone who may feel triggered or possibly re-traumatized by the content that I'm going to discuss. It does include physical violence and sexual violence. So if that's not something that you feel comfortable listening to, Go ahead and skip to one of the old videos that I've done so that, you know, you won't have to go through that experience because, of course, that's nothing that you have to go through. And I just want to give you plenty of warning in advance. I feel like I've rambled on about this long enough for you to know that you should probably turn the video off probably like right now because it's go time. I feel there are, at the very least, five intersections for the book Heavy and the book Hunger. So at least five intersections that I noticed. Five themes that intersect for both. First of the five intersections is the weight. After experiencing the trauma of the physical abuse and the sexual abuse, both authors use food as a coping mechanism. Roxane Gay uses food to create a bigger body, to create a, big, a buffer between herself and society, to create this body that would not be desired by anyone, to create a zone of safety around herself within her ability to control. And so she built up this armor of weight to protect her from anyone trying to harm her. At the same time, I mean, not literally at the same time, but in Mr. Lehman's book, you see Mr. Lehman using food to stuff feelings, to stuff emotions. The side effect of which was a larger body. But I don't necessarily feel that Mr. Lehman was, was eating to create a buffer between himself. Or at least that's not what I got from his writing. Trying to create this buffer, trying to become this tank like Miss Gay does to create this buffer, to create this shield. I think he just, it seems to me, I should say, that Mr. Lehman just used food to stuff feelings and to feel better. Because in, in, in addition to helping, helping to tamp down feelings, eating foods, especially carbs, probably any food really, but especially something sweet, in my experience, can help you can alter, you know, your mood. And so that may be another way that Mr. Lemon dealt with the feelings and the trauma of his childhood was through eating. The second intersection that I noticed was addiction resulting from, it seems, the trauma that both of these authors faced in their childhood. I'm certainly not a psychologist or a psychiatrist, so this is also my, so my part for just from what I read, but, but both of these authors seem to have developed addiction for Mr. Lehman. It was food eating to stuff feelings. And eventually as he became an adult, it became gambling. Sort of these two sort of addictions that he developed as a coping mechanism. Mr. Lehman also suffered at one point from anorexia. So again, there are these manifestations of him trying to cope with his trauma. There are sections in the book where after so many people were voicing their concern about how large he was becoming, he finally landed on exercise and really restricting his calories so that he could control his body, his unruly body, as Roxanne Gay, I believe, says. And the use of exercise and the use of calorie restrictions slimmed his body down, got him some control, but 
it went beyond mere weight loss or health. It really moved into him restricting calories to the point that he would pass out. Exercising to the point where he would pass out. That's not healthy. That's not a healthy approach to exercise. And so it just becomes yet another feature of his addictive personality, it seems to me. And let's remember, I am not a psychiatrist, but just on the plain reading of the memoir, this is what this is what I gleaned, this is what I gathered from what I read. Roxanne Gay experiences something similar with relation to food. She's using food to, to create this larger, bulky body so that she won't be attached, won't be targeted, helping with the feelings. And she, too, at one point, learns or comes across or discovers the ability to eat, to stuff herself, and then to relieve that, to not have the effects of additional gaining additional weight, learns to purge. She'll bend, she'll purge. And again, because people in her surroundings, people in her family voice concerned over her weight, I feel that the bulimia was a way for her to maybe gain some sort of control over a body that was bigger and in theory safer, but now not healthier. The third intersection that I'll discuss is of course the originating violence and abuse Mr. Layman and Miss Gay suffered when they were children or when they were young, young people, kids for Roxanne Gay, in her memoir, she relates how after this horrible, horrible, terrible, horrible thing happens to her, she is unable to tell her parents, her brothers, her friends, her true friends, anyone within her social family circle because she is so afraid of being labeled as a bad girl, as not a good Christian or Catholic. I can't remember which denomination she belonged to. And she, she therefore suffered this egregious, egregious, horrible act in silence. And those feelings seem to turn in on her, which is um, perhaps why she felt like, well, in order to protect myself, in order to not be a target, I'll have this really big body and no one, no one will look at me. No one will pay attention to me and I can create some safety for myself in that. And then I will also not tell my family because I, I don't want them to not love me or not think that I'm a good girl. For Mr. Lehman, the violence resulted, it seems, in a lot of forced down anger. And let's remember, Mr. Lehman grew up in Jackson, Mississippi. As happens anywhere in the country, the, the focus of attention in so many ways for young people who are, who are intelligent, who, who have abilities academically, especially when those abilities aren't expected to be there for the particular individual, Fighting that kind of, fighting against that kind of soft bigotry of low expectations is something that it seems that Kiese Lehman had to deal with his entire life. If I remember correctly, Mr. Lehman went to one of the private Christian academies here in Metro Jackson. And so consequently, he's taken out of a school system that is, of course, majority minority and into a system where he is the minority. His having to deal with the almost seemingly constant surprise that he he would he was an intelligent young man is is something that he had to deal with throughout high school, even moving on to college, and the resentment that he writes about from the administrations from his teachers and professors in addition to just being a young black man in this country in addition to 
having suffered the trauma of some physical violence and some sexual violence is just packing all of that one on top of the other. It's no surprise to me that he would, that food would be the way, easy way, accessible way for him to stuff feelings, stuff anger, and to deal with his situation. Not to mention the very tense, complex relationship that Mr. Lehman has with his mother. There's just, there's so much that he had to work through, has had to work through, continues to work through. The fourth intersection of these two books, Heavy and Hunger, is fear and loneliness. And I guess I need to add anger, fury, rage, maybe, I don't know, in there as well. For Mr. Lehman, dealing with the, the abuse of his childhood, to me, seemed to, seemed to manifest itself in his gambling addiction, in his overeating, and then in his calorie restriction addiction to exercise, but also at some point when he's finally graduated, you know, made it through the, the, the obstacles placed in his path in college, he manages to continue his education and he eventually becomes a professor. And his, and so it's not initially not in Mississippi, but somewhere up north. I cannot remember the name of the college and I'm not gonna look for it either. Um, <laughs> while he's a professor at the college, he, he runs into some of the things that you run into with an administration of anywhere, be it a college, be it state government, federal government, he runs into some of those, he runs into those sort of typical um, clashing of values, but he also, it seemed to me, and I don't think he used these words, but it seemed to me that maybe he, there was a bit of imposter syndrome going on for him. Maybe, I could be very wrong. I don't believe imposter syndrome is a phrase that he actually ever used. But that's just something that I seem to pick up, that I seem to pick up from reading the book. Fear and loneliness in Roxane Gay's life seems to manifest itself in maybe not the healthiest of relationships, or maybe even when a relationship is healthy, walking away from said relationship. But also there's that, that and I'm going to say PTSD. Again, I don't think she ever uses the term PTSD in her memoir, but the the trauma that she suffered, one would think, one would not be surprised if she suffered from PTSD. Not saying that she does, not trying to diagnose, not a doctor, don't even play one on TV. But Miss Gay seems to have isolated herself because well into her adulthood, Miss Gay did not reveal um, did not reveal what had happened to her as a young person. And she went through depression. She went through a lot of negative behavior. She even at one point cut herself off completely from her family because she I, I seemed like from what I got from the book, she was just overwhelmed with this sort of guilt and shame and fear that they would reject her. So before they could reject her, she rejected them or she removed herself from them. I believe there was a whole year where she didn't contact her family. They didn't know where she was. So that sort of isolation, because she's not able to tell this big truth about herself because she's so terrified that the, that she'll be judged and that they'll, they'll walk away from her and they won't think that she's a good person or a worthy person. That it is most certainly a, a yet another tactic to control, to control your surroundings, to control the things that can possibly hurt you. And so for Miss Gay and for Mr. Lehman, it seems that they both are are isolated in their in their aspects. Roxanne Gay is sort of isolated. She moves across country away from her family so that so that they're not close, so that she, you know, can whatever happens happens in her life, but she's not she's not 
in contact with her family. And Mr. Layman seems to be this isolated figure in this ivory tower of academia. Mr. Layman seemed to me to identify a lot more closely with his students than he did with the professors and the administration of, of, of the college where he worked. And that may be true for all new professors. You know, when you first start, you've just most recently been a student and now you are a professor. And so you're navigating that switch and that can be very isolating because you're not a student, but you're, you're not sort of completely a part of the professors, the professor cliques, if you will, the administration. And so that can be, that can be isolating as well. The fifth intersection for me would be, of course, their ability to persevere beyond the trauma of their childhood, their addictive coping mechanisms. Both writers have worked in their own way because, you know, not necessarily seeking professional help through a psychologist or a psychiatrist. Both writers have continued. <laughs> they have persevered. They have worked through the mire of the of their personal traumas and are reaching for healthier ways to cope. Um Roxane Gay also talks about, which is what I really liked, and I think one of the biggest things that I got from her book was how she, as a larger bodied woman, has to navigate a world, a society, a physical environment built not to accommodate people of larger sizes. I, I just, I hadn't really thought about it until I read those words. And I think at that point I closed the book and I really thought about it. I was like, chairs, um, stairs. Um, there are so many other things that she spoke about having to try to force her body into these places where she really didn't fit and the bruises and the marks and the, 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 the pain that she suffered because of this. It's just really, it's really interesting for as aware as I would like to think I am. There are so many blind spots for me. And I think that is one of the reasons that I like to read and why I want to expand the material that I read so that I can become aware of those blind spots and start looking in that direction. I sincerely hope this video isn't too rambling or incoherent for you to understand that I truly enjoyed both books, will read them and will read them again in the future. I, I just thought they were revealing, intense. You will feel for both of them as you read the books and I think that there's an opportunity for you to learn from the path that they've traveled up to now. That's all I have for you today, book nerds. Remember, if you like the video, please leave me a like. If you're enjoying the content, go ahead and subscribe so that you'll get more. And if you want to be notified when I put out a new video, go ahead and ring that notification bell. And remember, no matter what you have to do within your day, there's always time to read. Bye-bye.